CSR CLRI. Today's speaker, Professor Jagdish, colleagues, and dear students, welcome and good morning to you all. Today we have gathered here to listen to the Azadika Amrit Mahotsav and Nayudamma Centenary Lecture. Azadika Amrit Mahotsav is an initiative of the government of India to celebrate and commemorate 75 years of progressive India and the glorious history of its freedom struggle, people, culture, and achievements. While the Azadika Amrit Mahotsav is being celebrated all over India, we at CSRS LRI today celebrate the same in conjunction with Nayudamma Centenary Lecture. We have with us today an eminent personality, the leading nanotechnology researcher and the distinguished professor of physics and the next president of the Australian Academy of Science, Professor Shenupati Jagdish, who will be delivering the Nayudamma Centenary Lecture. Now I request the director, Dr. K.J. Sriram to address the gathering and say a few words on Nayudamma Centenary Lecture. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amit. Uh, thank you, Professor Jagdish, for uh, having readily accepted the invitation from my end. Uh, to all those my of colleagues who have joined in from various places, uh, this year, the Central Leather Research Institute is celebrating the 100 years of Naiduama. Uh, Professor Naiduama uh, has been a scientist with a total difference compared to many other scientists that we may know. He has been a social scientist. He has been looking at always the development of the society uh, in his scheme of things. For him, science was for the society. Development of the society was what was meant to him as uh, science. As the second director of the Central Leather Research Institute, Dr. Naidama not only took the leather industry from being a cottage industry to something which is more of a technology-oriented trade, he also ensured that the people who were dependent on the leather industry, their livelihoods changed drastically because of uh, the industry. He introduced what we today know, uh, know as the fashion shows. He, uh, he organized for the first time in 1964, a fashion show well within this institute itself, and thus brought to light the uh, glory of leather as a fashion commodity. He actually said that leather is the only thing which links a big farmer with the fashion world of the uh, best. And he also brought what today we call as the Academy Research Industry Partnership, wherein uh, we conducted every year what we were what used to be known as the Tanners Get Together. Now, the Tanners Get Together comes just a few days before the India International Leather Fair. Today, the Leather Fair, which started in the campus of CLRI, has grown tremendously and has become a landmark event of the country. Uh, organized by the uh, International uh, Indian Trade Promotion Organization. This used to be held from 31st of January to the February 4th. We have not had a physical uh, fair because of the COVID for the last two years, but usually January 28th also marks the beginning of the Tanners Get Together, which we subsequently renamed as the Leather Research Industry Get Together and recent times the Leather Research Industry Government Conclave. Uh, so, the first thing that happens in the lyric programs is a Naidoma lecture. So, in honor of Dr. Naidoma, we thought that somebody who can, who can speak about the science and that can do wonders to the society should always be giving the lecture. And I'm very happy and thankful that Professor Jagdish readily agreed to our invitation uh, to deliver this lecture. I'm very sure uh, that uh, Dr. Jagdish's uh, lecture would be a real good motivating factor to several of our students who are attending this uh, lecture from different parts and maybe in groups and whatnot. Uh, so with no uh, delay, uh, I will request Amit to give a framework of uh, this uh, lecture and then uh, request Professor Jagdish to deliver this talk. Amit. Sir, it's now time to introduce our speaker, Professor C. Jagdish. Professor Jagdish is a distinguished professor and head of semiconductor optoelectronics and nanotechnology group in the Research School of Physics, Australian National University. Professor Jagdish is the editor in chief of Applied Physics Reviews, editor of three book series, and serves on editorial boards of 19 other journals. He has published more than 1,000 research papers, 
hold six U.S. patents, co-authored a book, co-edited 15 books, and edited 12 conference proceedings and 20 special issues of journals. He is a fellow of 11 science and engineering academies from USA, Australia, Europe, and India, and 14 professional societies, IEEE, MRS, APS, etc. He received many awards, including IEEE Pioneer Award in Nanotechnology, IEEE Photonic Society Engineering Achievement Award, OSA Nick Holoniak Award, IUMRS Somiya Award, UNESCO Medal for his contributions to the development of nanoscience and nanotechnologies, and Lyle Medal for Australian Academy of Science for his contribution to physics. He has received Australia's highest civilian award, AC, Companion of the Order of Australia, for his contributions to physics and engineering, in particular nanotechnology. He has been elected as the next president of the Australian Academy of Science, and he is the first Australian of Indian heritage in his role. We are proud of his achievements. Without further ado, I now request Professor Jagdish to deliver his talk. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sriram, for inviting me to participate in this uh, important uh, centenary lecture in honor of uh, Professor Naidama. And uh, also that, uh, the, let me see. So particularly, it is really special for me. And also I would like to thank uh, Amit uh, Venekar as well for the, your kind introduction. So let me see whether I could get out of this uh, mode. And, Sorry for that, and uh, just let me see whether it's in the. Sorry, we just checked and everything was working fine, but uh, somehow. It's now okay, browser. It's now okay. Can you see? Yeah, it's can you see the slides? Yes, yes, we can yeah. see, sir. Uh, you just came out of the screen share mode now. Yeah, now you're back. Okay, that's good. Okay, okay. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the director of CLRI, Professor KJ Shiram, and also Dr. Amit Venekar uh, for your kind introductions. And uh, it's an absolute pleasure and honor for me to really uh, speak to all of you today in honor of Professor, uh, late Professor Naidama. And uh, so really, it has been mentioned that I am from the Australian National University in uh, Canberra, but I also have other appointments in India and Japan and China and Taiwan and US and UK. It's really been a pleasure and honor for me to be associated with these institutions as an honorary, honorary professor, including Anna University in Chennai, where I understand that CLRI and the Anna University have got very strong links with each other. So really, Professor Naidama has been a really you know, a, my childhood hero. You know, so the reason I say that one is that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, I come from a small village in India, and in fact, not too far from Professor Naidama's uh, village itself. In fact, I studied in uh, Tenali and Guntur, and which is again very close to Professor Naidama's native place. And in my childhood, and uh, my father used to really tell about Professor Naidama, and in fact, encouraged me to uh, study net level technology, inspired by Professor Naidama's uh, excellent efforts in really doing. Uh, uh, this work, which is good for the community and then the people, particularly at the bottom end of the society, for example. So that's why Professor Naidama is always called as a people scientist because he really understands, brought many people to CLRI and worked very closely with people and then really has got an open door policy. Anybody can come to CLRI. And I'm glad to see that CLRI is continuing that legacy. And I, this is also my third lecture in honoring Professor Naidama. And I had an honor of giving this Snydama lecture, memorial lecture and award in AP Science Congress in Vishakhapatnam and all in 2017. And also Snydama Center of Sustainable Development has honored me with an Idama award and lecture as well in 2018. I once again want to thank you for inviting me to participate in, the, in this important the centenary celebrations of Professor Snydama. And because of the fact that uh, I've always looked up to Professor Snydama as uh, my childhood science hero. And today's talk is really a collective effort between my group at the Australian National University and many groups in uh, Australia, US, UK, China, Sweden, Italy, Russia, Switzerland. The beauty of science is that there are no national boundaries and we can all work together. And by working together, we can be able to make a much bigger impact in science. And then that's been always been our focus. 
And I've only listed the professors or the senior researchers in the groups here, but also that uh, many PhD students and postdocs also contributed our research, joint research, and I want to thank all of them. This is my group at the Australian National University, and uh, again here, and uh, I would like to really acknowledge uh, about 10 to 12 nationalities at any one time, including the I think we have lost the connection. So I just would like to, okay. And uh, so really, I want to thank my academic colleagues. Those are leading various aspects of our group's research and uh, really working with very closely with our students and postdoctoral fellows. And I also want to thank our funding agencies. So here is overview of my talk, and I'll give you the motivation for why we're interested in working on these semiconductor nanostructures. And I'll tell you about how do we grow these nanowires and nanostructures. And we'll give you some examples of the applications of these nanostructures for a wide variety of applications. As, as uh, Director Professor Sriram has mentioned, Professor Naidam has always looked for applications of science. And it's really important for the future of the society in terms of seeing what we're doing and how we're able to make an impact in the society. I also want to take this opportunity to thank many groups, those are working in this field of uh, nanowires and nanostructures in various parts of the world, including India, because science is a collective effort and then really we need, it's important for us to acknowledge other groups, those are working or contributed to our discipline in, in, uh, before us, because really knowledge has been built based on others' contributions. So up to electronics and uh, all of us know about electronics. And then of course we are using computers and their electronic devices. They have uh, computer chips are there, they're all electronic devices. Any electronic device you're using, most likely they're all made out of silicon, for example. So what is optoelectronic? Optoelectronics is conversion of electricity into light using light emitting diodes and lasers or conversion of light into electricity using solar cells or detectors, for example. So while silicon is an excellent semiconductor for microelectronics or nanoelectronics, but unfortunately it is not a very good light emitter if I want to make light emitting diodes or lasers, for example, because of its indirect band gap semiconductor. So you need to have a direct band gap semiconductor in order to be able to get efficient light emission. And that's where we end up using these group three, five semiconductors of gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, gallium nitride, indium nitride, gallium antimonide, combinations of these materials in the group three and group five of the periodic table. Different semiconductors have a different band gaps, the minimum in the conduction band and the maximum in the valence band, and they're all taking place at the same wave vector. That's why you end, up, you, you end up using these direct band gap semiconductors. In fact, the developments of the nitride semiconductors led to the development of the blue LED. And uh, so really blue LED is uh, really missing link for till that point. And we were using other semiconductors to make red LEDs and green LEDs. And of course, in the absence of blue LED, the tri third primary color, it was difficult to make white LEDs. So now because of presence of all these three colors, and now we're able to make white LEDs and LED lighting, for example, and uh, LED light bulbs, for example. And uh, so nowadays we're using them. They're consuming less energy and also get that lo last long period of time as well. In fact, many of my students are manufacturing uh, millions of LEDs in various parts of the world. And also these LEDs are used for making large area displays and solid state lighting, which has been you know, lighting the bridges or lighting the homes. Really it's also lighting, all the car lights nowadays are also, traffic lights are all made out of LEDs these days. These semiconductors which are making for LEDs also can be used for making lasers and which are widely used in terms of laser cutting and laser machining and also lasers for communication and laser displays and a wide variety of things. And in fact, uh, as many of you know that uh, lasers are widely used in cutting of the leather and also the uh, processing of the leather and there's also the engraving of the leather and all things, lasers are quite widely used, for example. Okay. And uh, today I'm able to talk to you because of internet. Internet is really, backbone of internet is optical fiber communications. Electrical signals from my computer are converted to optical signals using lasers. And these laser signals are passed through 
for the optical fibers and other and your other end, and then we are converting this light signals or laser light into uh, photo using photo detectors and electrical signal. That's why we're able to communicate with each other. And particularly the lasers which are used and the detectors which are used in this area is about 1,315-50 nanometers. It's an infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And because that's where the smallest amount, lowest amount of absorption and dispersion takes place. Okay. So again, I mentioned to you that the same material which are used for making LEDs and lasers could also be used for detectors and solar cells. In fact, nowadays, you know, these solar cells which are so-called multi-junction solar cells, various solar cells which are stacked on each other, and they've got efficiencies exceeding 47% or so. And these solar cells are widely used for space applications because the satellites require the most efficient solar cells. And uh, But nowadays, people are also looking at the creating terrestrial applications and the concentrated photovoltaic systems where you want to have the most efficient solar cells there at this focal point here, because you can create about uh, using this reflector about 500 suns or 1,000 suns of uh, light focus here. And that means you want to have the most efficient solar cells here. Same materials could also be used for infrared detectors, which are used for biomedical imaging applications, night vision applications, and also looking at them in the manufacturing of looking at the heat generation in the computer chips, for example. So again, to re redistribute the heat so that you are not really burning these computer chips, for example. So really, semiconductors really play an important role. Optoelectronic devices play an important role in the current society. The nanowires are nanostructures. Nanowires are seen as building blocks for the next generation electronics and photonics. One of the unique things with the nanowires is that you can really make nanowires of any material on any substrate without the worry about the lattice constant differences between the substrate and then the nanowire which are really growing. Because of their nanostructures, either they can expand or contract if there's this, this lattice constant sort of larger or smaller than the substrate lattice constant, for example. Lattice constant is a unit cell of the crystal which really repeats itself in all three dimensions in a crystal. You can also make actual heterostructures. This green material is different than the red material. You can also make PN junctions by doping different parts of the nanowire with the P-type dopants or N-type dopants. That means each nanowire you can make a diode which is useful for solar cells and then lasers and LEDs and other things which I will come back to. You can also create radial heterostructures. This, uh, this uh, red material is different than this brown material, and uh, that means you know you can really create a multi-layered structure, so-called radial or four shell nanowires. You can also create the branch nanowires to create some opportunities for, for, us, for you to be able to make three-dimensional architectures, for example. So in fact, some of the examples from our own laboratory where we have shown gallium can be grown on top of gallium arsenide despite large lattice mismatch. We're able to show that you can make atomically perfect gallium on top of gallium arsenide. You can create the branch nanowires, which could be very useful for cantilevers and also scanning probes. Also, we created indium phosphide nano trees, which are very good for energy harvesting applications, like the, the splitting water to generate hydrogen as a clean energy source. And also, indium phosphide nanowires, too, where nowadays we're moving towards membranes rather than just nanowires, which I'll come back and then share with you. And of course, many optoelectronic devices have been demonstrated or photonic devices, but we end up using optoelectronics and photonics alternatively. Photonics is nothing but you know, light-based technologies. Electronics is electron-based technologies. And also most recently, the uh, IBM Zurich has demonstrated indium gallium arsenide nanowire transistors on silicon wafers of six inch wafers because they want to use these nanowires for transistors as well, not only for optoelectronic devices. So that's why people see these nanowires as building blocks for the next generation electronics and photonics. If these nanowires are so much of importance, how do we make them? There are two main techniques which we use. One is called as a metal catalyzed VLS growth process, where what we do is that we take some semiconductor substrate, for example, I'm giving an example of gallium arsenide substrate. We put these nanoparticles, colloidal solution of nanoparticles of gold, which you can commercially buy them from you know, five nanometers to up to 300 nanometers in diameter. We put a droplet of this, say, for example, 50 nanometer gold nanoparticles on top of this gallium arsenide substrate. And gold has got a melting temperature more than 1,000 degrees Celsius. But once the gold starts reacting with the gallium or aluminum or indium, then the yellow liquid of the gold, gold gallium or gold aluminum or gold indium, alloy has got a melting temperature as small as 350 degrees Celsius. Okay? We call it as a eutectic liquid. Then if you put this in this gallium arsenide reactor and MOCVD reactor, metal organic chemical vapor deposition reactor, 
and uh, in and heat up to somewhere between 370 to 500 degrees celsius and then it end up creating this alloy liquid of gold gallium and then introduce gases needed for the growth of gallium arsenide trimethyl gallium and arsine these gases freely dissolve in this liquid it gets super saturated and crystals start dissipating out and gold is always sitting on the top here and this is like essentially if you are you know dissolving the sugar in the water and then above certain uh, concentration solubility limit is exceeded and sugar crystals start dissipating out and salt crystals start dissipating out they are using salt the same physics is happening here as well this is in fact the work of my former student dr hena joyce who is now an associate professor at uh, uh, cambridge university during her phd she demonstrated this atomically perfect gallium arsenide nanowires which are cylindrically shaped and you can see the gold nanoparticles sitting on the top here and then you can see the atomically perfect gallium arsenide nanowires this is a transmission electron microscope image here indicating using something called a two temperature growth process which I'll not have time to go into the details and we were able to demonstrate these atomically perfect nanowires and uh, so then the alternative technique is called selective epitaxy in this case we don't use any metals because sometimes you don't want to use metals for example if i want to grow nanowires on silicon gold and silicon don't get along well because gold acts like a non relativity combination center in this case i'm giving an example of indium phosphide we take an indium phosphide substrate and deposit some silicon dioxide using plasma and hence can for the deposition and uh, deposit some uh, spin coat the photoresist and then do electron lithography and create patterns of holes and then you etch through those holes so that we are etching through the silicon dioxide so that in these holes indium phosphide crystal is exposed then you put this one into the immersive reactor and heat it up to somewhere between 60 to 750 degrees celsius and introduce the gas as needed for the growth of indium phosphide trimethyl indium and phosphine and then these gases dissociate and crystal start dissipating out and now you can see you can create these ordered patterns of these indium phosphide nanowires if you go and look at the top view of this one you can see beautiful hexagonal facets because crystals like to be in the faceted form because that's the lowest energy form for these crystals for example we've taken these nanowires and then excited with the laser pulse to really create electron hole phase and start looking at the light emission and quantify the quantum efficiency of the light emission as a function of the excitation power density of the laser you can see the red curve is showing the quantum efficiency is as high as 50 percent and then we compare this one with the epitaxial layers or the two dimensional layers which we normally grow in these semiconductors and then you can also see the blue curve and both are very much comparable indicating that the surface broken bonds on the surface do not play detrimental role in the case of indium phosphide and you can make use of these indium phosphide nanowires for making lasers in the solar cells or infrared detectors and what are the optical electronic devices you want to really make which i will come back to but that is not always the case in the case of gallium arsenide the broken bonds on the surface really create the defect states within the band gap of the semiconductor it really creates a havoc in terms of the right emission properties of indium uh, gallium arsenide which we had to passivate the surface in order to be able to create a core cell structure and in order to be able to really avoid that particular problem which again i will not have time to go into the details so then when we are making these nanowires in a, creating a mask and opening hole we asked ourselves what will help happen and if you open a slot or a ring and in this case and so again this is the work of my student dr nain wong and continuing the work of dr chian gao whom i showed you earlier about this gallium phosphide nanowires and you can see that sir uh, by creating these patterns and again instead of writing a hole and you create a slot or a ring so that you can see what type of structures you can really get if you change the shapes of these holes for example again nain wong has spent a lot of time in optimizing various growth conditions i will not have to go into the time into the details of these structures and if you have any specific questions i am and happy to answer them afterwards so here is a case when you open this slot on this particular crystallographic orientation of 101 bar put this one at the immersive reactor heat it up to somewhere between 60 to 750 degrees celsius and introduce the gases needed for the growth of indium phosphide you can see now you can get these beautiful nano membranes with this particular side wall facets of these ones we open this slot along another crystallographic orientation which is shown here and again you do the same thing you also get the membranes but these membranes have got a different side wall facet than these ones also these membranes are thicker than these ones because of the lateral growth is taking place in this case but if you open the slot in between these two orientations you can really start getting these beautiful diamond like structures with these alternating facets or so so now we can see 
instead of just making nano wires, we can really make you know thin membranes, thick membranes, and then nano diamonds and a wide variety of structures. And in fact, we're using these nano membranes for making nano membrane transistors, lasers, and also for MEMS applications and a range of things, for example. And what will happen if you open a ring? Well, if you open a ring and again do the same thing, growth of these structures at high temperatures. And again, you can see this, you can create these beautiful ring-like structures. And then with this alternating facets also here, or the same facet you can really see nicely here. Again, Nayan Wong has spent a lot of time in optimizing these growth conditions, which I will not have time to go into details about. Okay. And if you keep on growing, then what happens is that this gap in the middle gets filled up and you create a horizontal membrane. If you keep on growing further and you end up having this nice hexagonally faceted membrane again, because of the fact that these crystals like to be the low energy facets and that's why end up creating these nice, beautiful hexagonally faceted membranes. Again, as I mentioned, these membranes are very useful for MEMS applications. Also. So we've taken these nano structures of the nano membranes and nano diamonds or nano rings, and then excited these ones with an electron, electron microscope, scanning electron microscope with an electron beam, and to really excite the electrons from the valence band to the conduction band, as and when they fall down and emit light. This is so-called cathode luminescence. Earlier, we were using lasers. That's why we call them as photoluminescence. In this case, we're using electron beam. We call it as a cathode luminescence. You can see these nine nice structures. All of them are really emitting very bright light, and also uniform light, indicating that there are no defects when introduced during this growth process. And again, hard work of four years of uh, Nain Wong has really paid off in terms of making these beautiful structures. In fact, we're using these uh, ring-like structures for making the ring-resonator lasers, which I'll come back and then share with you. So you can see that you know, the opportunities are enormous, and you can create star-like structures and these uh, bout antennas here. And then also ring like structures, you know, even the, you know, the gate like structures and the spirals, and all sorts of exotic structures we can make use of for a wide variety of applications. So, till now, I've mainly spoken about the materials and the nanostructures and nano wires, how to grow them, how to make sure that they're of excellent crystal quality, and also they're emitting bright light for our electronic device applications. So, now let me move towards applications because this person, Naidama, has always believed in. And the science needs to be really beneficial to the humanity, and we need to really always look about the applications also. So we are all, of course, as I mentioned, that lasers nowadays we're all using every day in whatever we are doing. And uh, so really, what a, what a laser. All of us have studied in undergraduate optics courses. You need to have a gain medium, and you need to have the cavity formation by putting some mirrors. You need to pump the gain medium to create population inversion. And as and when the model gain is equal to the optical losses, lasing starts taking place. This equation is telling the same thing essentially. Gain need to be equal to the internal optical losses and mirror losses, then only lasing starts taking place. If you take a nano wire and then of the right dimensions and right diameter, and uh, so you excite this nano wire with the laser pulse, light starts propagating along the length of the nano wire because nano wire starts behaving like a wave guide because of the fact that the high refractive index of this nanowire of 3.4, surrounding air or vacuum refractive index is one, for example. And also both ends of the nanowire acts like mirrors because of the refractive index difference again. So because we're using these three-phi semiconductors, they automatically, uh, three -phi direct band gap semiconductors, they've got gain. And then you also got a laser cavity without having to put mirrors or anything of that sort. So that really opens up opportunities for us to be able to design these nanowires correctly, and then grow the excellent quality nanowires. Each nanowire in principle should act like a laser. In fact, we have been working in this uh, area for a long time. And you can see that we have really demonstrated a wide variety of lasers. And uh, particularly this work has been led by my former student and young colleague, uh, Professor Sudama Kapati, and now she's at Monash University. You can see that uh, many students have demonstrated this wide variety of lasers, but I'll not have time to go into the details of these ones. And I'll just give you one or two examples of what type of lasers which we're really able to make. Drew Saxena, first student who worked on these lasers, who is now at Imperial College, and he has really de designed these lasers by looking at various optical modes which are propagated with these nanowires, for example. And you can see that the how light is propagated with these 260 nanometer gallium arsenide nanowires. And uh, so really the simulations play an important role in the dealing with nanotechnology because intuitive physics sometimes doesn't work. And then we, we end up doing lots of simulations and design before making any devices, for example. So to cut the long story short, and then you can see that these are two 
based on the design of Prabhu Saxena, my another student, Dr. Jenny Jiang, now she's at Cambridge University. She has grown this 260 nanometer gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide four cell nanowire, which is about six microns long. We transfer them onto a glass slide and excite with the laser pulse and we get the light coming out. Below threshold, you see a very broad light emission. Above threshold, you see a very narrow line emission. That's what you would expect for a laser because you really coherent light, you're really emitting light. The LEDs are like essentially like light bulbs, which are incoherent light and also broad wavelengths of light has been emitted. But whereas lasers typically end up having a very narrow line of light emission takes place. And you can see the light output versus pump intensity. You can see the below threshold, you end up seeing the spontaneous emission of the light behaving like an LED. Then you end up seeing the amplified spontaneous emission ultimately lasing or so. And again, typically we try to plot the log log plot, seeing that whether you got the S-type curve or not to confirm the two lasing is taking place. In fact, Dusaxena measured these interference fringes experimentally and simulated, and then we able to really match these ones very well. And in fact, this work has been published about nine years back or so in Nature Photonics. And these are the first gallium arsenide nanowire lasers operating at room temperature. Okay. Because ultimately, you know, if you really do some science, you know, you end up making lasers which are operating at very low temperatures. Sometimes, you know, they may not be of interest for industry, and that's why it's important to make sure that these are being operating at room temperature at least. Okay. And these lasers, we are planning to use them for a wide variety of applications, for sensing applications and the photonic integrated circuit applications and a range of things. So, in fact, we are working with our colleagues at the University of South Clyde and Professor Martin Dawson's group. And uh, so you, they develop a technique called nanoscale transfer printing technique. They come up with a PDMS temp and then they pick up the nano wires and then you drop them wherever you want precisely, nanoscale relocation of these nano wires wherever you want, for example. Again, Dr. Ben Hoa uh, in their research fellow in their group, has spent a lot of time in optimizing this particular technique. Here's a case where these nanowire lasers have been transferred in front of this wide junction waveguide, SEA polymer waveguide. And you can see these nanowire lasers are here. And we're looking at the light coming out of this side of this wide junction waveguide, which could be used for multiplexing and demultiplexing applications. And you can see this nanowire, this light is really nicely been propagated to this one, indicating that these nanowire lasers are very useful for, for polymer optical electronics applications or so. And this work has been done by PhD student in University of Strathclyde. Uh, now the, the, the Dimitar Jevtics, and he has done a great job from the point of view. So then we asked them, can we be able to couple these nano wire lasers into nano antennas by using this transfer printing technique? This really precise location is needed. This is work of my young colleague. Now she's a full professor at uh, Nanjing University. And uh, she has been working on this something called terahertz metamaterials. So she's been designing these nano antennas. In these nano antennas, there was a gap here. And uh, so then they, we wanted them to locate these nano wires precisely in this gap here. You can see the close up of this particular one here. You can see the nano wire here. Here is the aluminum nano antenna, which she has designed, for example. If you do not have any nano antenna, light is coming from the both ends of the nano wire, as I've shown you earlier, because nano wire uh, act like a fabric of cavity. And but when you got this nano antenna, and suddenly light is coming from the vertical direction. And uh, so creating, allowing us to be able to make this something called a vertical emitting nanowire laser. Again, these are operating at room temperature. Again, it created a lot of excitement in the community. You can see the threshold-like behavior. Here it's acting like a light emitting diode and here it's acting like a laser. Again, narrow line width as well. And uh, so really, depending on where, what applications you are using and you have to use a particular kind of lasers. If I'm coupling the light to an optical fiber and optical waveguide, it is better to have the light coming at the end of the nanowire, and then that's where you end up using these ones. If you want to use them for, for example, facial recognition applications, for example, nowadays in the iPhones and others, people use these facial recognition uh, uh, the lasers, and then you can make use of these vertical emitting lasers, and also there for laser displays, and also meta-optics applications and other things, and for a wide variety of applications, we started exploring these ones now. So I told you about ring resonators. And then again, this is a new work of my student, and they won. Uh, and then he, this is a ring resonators, which I showed you earlier. Again, he designed what should be the diameter of the ring, what should be the width of the ring, what should be the height of the ring. And then based on his designs, and he has designed, he's really made this nano, nano rings using MOCVD again, same as I explained earlier. We excite these ones with the laser pulse and look at the light coming from these ones. 
Below threshold, you see a broad light emission, and you can see the broad spectrum below here. And again, above threshold, you see very narrow line width, and also these whispering gallery mode lasers. And these are ring resonators typically end up having whispering gallery modes. And in fact, these are the measured whispering gallery modes and theoretically calculated, they match very well again. Again, these are room temperature operating for the first time. We're able to demonstrate bottom-up approach of these ring resonator lasers, threshold-like behavior and S-type plot and other things. In fact, this work has been published only late last year. And again, many of my colleagues are really involved in this particular work here. So till now, I've only shown you optically pumped lasers. So ultimately, if your industry is interested, they want to have electrically pumped lasers. So the question now is that, you know, how do you really make electrically pumped lasers? If you need to have a PN junction to make a diode, I mentioned to you earlier, what we do is that this work of Dr. In Su Kiang, and then who is now uh, my former student, who is now a research engineer in Samsung in Korea. He has doped this indium phosphide with a P-type dopant like zinc, and then he's grown this indium gallium arsenide quantum well, this yellow layer here, and then he finished off with the top indium phosphide N-type with the silicon dopant N-type, zinc oxide, indium phosphide, which is acting like an N-type dopant, for example. So now you can see that this is a schematic of the structure which he was aiming for, his actual device, which is really structure which is able to grow, which took about two years to optimize various structures in order to be able to get a good quality nanostructures and quantum well structure. And then he takes transfer them onto a glass slide and then make contacts using electron immunotography and putting some metal contacts to, so that you can inject current into these ones. He measures the IV characteristics, current voltage characteristics, and you can see nice diode-like behavior that's what you would expect. A forward bias, a higher mode current, reverse bias, you end up having very low current. And that's a diode behavior function. Then we inject more and more current and look at the light emission from these structures. You can see that the more the amount of current been injected, higher the amount of light which is coming out. You also can see two emission peaks. One is here, one is here. That's mainly because the quantum well which has been grown on the top, the so-called actual quantum well, has got a different thickness and composition of indium gallium arsenide here with respect to this radial quantum well, which is in the same thickness and decomposition there. So that's why you end up having two different emission wavelengths. But again, these are emitting in the near and far region. That's where the wavelength region which is important for optical fiber communications. But you do not see any narrowing of the line which I've shown you earlier. But also you don't see any threshold-like behavior which I've shown you earlier as well. So telling us that they're acting like a nanowire like in diodes, LEDs, but not like lasers. This particular work has been led by my, uh, my, uh, my colleague, Professor Lan Fu. So you can see, you ask the question, why? What's the, um, what's the particular problem? It turns out, in order to inject current into these nanowires, you need to put metals. But then if you put metals, they create the metals absorb the optical light. That means you know, what will happen is that uh, you end up having too much absorption, that is the cavity. You need to pump them harder to be able to get over those losses. That means you generate a lot of heat. It reduces the gain of the medium. You don't even pump it harder. It becomes like a vicious circle. So that's where, in fact, now we got another student, Victor Gagrani, who came from IIT Karakpur. She has been working last four years or so in really optimizing, replacing these metals with the indium tin oxide and aluminum and zinc oxide and other transparent conducting oxides to be able to make good enough for ohmic contacts on the surface on these narrow wires and reduce the metal absorption which we are having here with the hope that we'll be able to really demonstrate these nanowire lasers, electrical injected nanowire lasers. It's been a really, really challenging project and despite a lot of hard work of uh, Nikita, and uh, still we are not able to really make these things work. And I'm hoping in the next six months or so, she'll be able to demonstrate those ones before she graduates. So these are the so-called single nanowire, nanowire LEDs, which are very useful for sensing applications and a range of other applications as well. But before uh, Insu Kiang leaving a group, and he also made the nanowire, uh, nanowire uh, array LEDs. So he's grown this, again, the same type of nanowires instead of a, in this array of these ones, order patterns. And then the challenge is how to make contacts to these nanowires tips at the top here. We really deposit some polymer inside and then selectively etch the polymer to be able to expose the tips using plasma etching, and then put some indium tin oxide, which is a transport conducting oxide put some metal on the side and the bottom and then other metal as well, and then inject current and look at the IV characteristics. You can see the IV characteristics showing like a diode-like behavior, indicating again, in six hard work really paid off, and higher the amount of current you're injecting, higher the amount of light coming out of these ones. And again, you don't see any narrowing of the line width. And in fact, you can see that under the probe here, 
a very bright light is coming from these ones at the higher currents. Uh, even visually, you can be able to see these things. Okay. So again, these nano wire uh, added LEDs are very useful because of the fact that you're embedding them into polymer, you can be able to peel these things off so that you can be able to use it for foldable displays because Samsung and Apple and others are interested in foldable phones, foldable computers and our things. So that's why you should really spend a lot of time in be able to make these nano wire array LEDs for our future displays applications also. Now let me move from lasers and LEDs to terahertz radiation. What is terahertz radiation? Why that is important? So terahertz radiation falls between electronics and photonics. And uh, so the, when you talk about electronics, you talk about millimeter waves, RF waves, and milli, uh, microwaves. And in the case of photonics, you talk about ultraviolet light, visible light, and infrared light. And this falls between these two. Why are you interested in terahertz radiation? It turns out that uh, many molecules have got electronic signatures in the, uh, their signatures in the electromagnetic spectrum of the terahertz radiation here, for example. I'm giving you an example of a lactose, monohydrate, and hydrate and uh, wide variety of structures, particularly some of the chemicals like explosives and others. Terahertz radiation is the one which is very good for be able to be uh, off distance and without any physical contact, be able to be able to pick up from the air the, any of the, uh, the this explosive molecules are floating around using terahertz spectroscopy will be able to do that. But also terahertz radiation is reflected by metals. Nowadays, we don't use X-rays anymore because in the airports, because X-rays are the ionizing radiation, they create a lot of damage to the DNA. But there is terahertz radiation is a non-ionizing radiation because we can detect metals easily using terahertz radiation. People are now using in the airports, for example, in the box which you get into, for example, in the airport. Also, they could be useful for biomedical imaging applications, for cancer detection, and looking at the cavities in the teeth here. Also, wireless communications and for particularly 6G, terahertz is particularly local local area communication is going to play an important role. And also be able to detect water content in leaves so that you're able to only water the crops when they need to be rather than wasting a precise, uh, precious resource like water, for example. Terahertz detectors. And we've been working on terahertz sources and detectors. In this case, I'm giving an example of the nanowire terahertz detectors. This work is jointly with Oxford University with Professor Michael Johnston's group and Professor Laura Hertz's group. This is work of my former student, Dr. Kun Pang, who is now a postdoc at Oxford University. So she transfers these nanowires onto a quartz substrate and makes some electrical contacts using electron lithography and comes to an ammeter and excite this nanowire with the laser pulse to generate photocarriers, comes with the terahertz pulse, electric field of the terahertz pulse separates these carriers between these two contacts. You measure the photocurrent as a function of time. If you measure the current as a function of time, you can extract the electric field of the terahertz pulse as a function of time and also connect it to the material which we've been using for this purpose as well. So now, uh, again, to cut the long story short, and Kun Pung has spent a lot of time during her PhD and demonstrated first gallimass nine nanowire terahertz detectors operating at room temperature. Later on, extended this indium phosphide nanowire terahertz detectors. You can see she also makes use of these so called Bauta antennas. And then our simulations have shown that these Bauta antennas have got a broader bandwidth than some of the designs which she has used earlier. And then again, you can see the bulk reference terahertz detector has got a very broad bandwidth. And our nanowire detector also has got a similar bandwidth, indicating that despite the small dimensions of these nanowire structures, we're able to really get excellent signal to noise ratio. In fact, these are the bow tie here. And in fact, the nanowire is just connecting these two, uh, you know, these antennas which are here, because terahertz radiation is about 300 microns in wavelength. You want to couple that light into these nanowires, which are about 200 or 300 nanometers in diameter, about a few microns long or so. So during her postdoc at Oxford University, she has been developing this polarization result terahertz detectors. Instead of really having only this uh, is about antennas with only single nanowires here. And we try to put another nanowire set in the 90 degrees to the original one so that you can measure both X and Y polarization, for example, here. The challenge has been to avoid the physical contact between the top nanowires and the bottom nanowires. Again, working with my colleagues at the University of South Florida and Oxford as well. And you can see that she was able to fabricate these structures after three years of hard work of this, uh, the working with the electron lithography plus uh, these. Uh, nanoscale transfer printing technique with my colleagues at Stratford University. So what are we doing with these nano, uh, these polarization resolved detectors? So we can really learn a lot about using terahertz spectroscopy about biomolecules or chemical molecules, particularly chirality of the molecules, for example. And in this case, I'm giving an example of using this particular, uh, these detectors for terahertz metamaterials. 
So terahertz metamaterials is essentially manipulating terahertz radiation using these metamaterials. You send a terahertz pulse through this metamaterial, and it's, uh, it gets interacting with this terahertz metamaterial. Its polarization state changes. By using our detector, we can measure both horizontal polarization and then vertical polarization. So thereby, you can really understand this particular terahertz metamaterial which you designed, for example. So here's a case where I'm showing you an example of uh, these uh, fabricated terahertz metamaterials. And Kun Pung simulations show that the X, the X polarization should have, or the horizontal polarization should have this particular shape of transmission and to, through this particular structure. And then the vertical polarization or Y polarization should have this particular uh, profile. And then that's what exactly she measured using the, or precisely measured the, it is using detector both experimentally, both in X and Y polarizations here, for example. And in fact, uh, we were able to publish this work in Science Journal. And again, hard work of Kun Fung really paid off. And then she was particularly killed at a time in the middle of the pandemic. And uh, then she was very frustrated. And then this work really led to excellent outcome from her point of view. So now let me finish off with, uh, the, can we use it the nanowires for only for terahertz detectors or other detectors as well? In fact, we can use them for the visible and infrared detectors as well. So you can see that if it, by changing essentially the nanowire diameter, we can really change the resonances of these nanowire absorption of these nanowires. See, we're changing the diameter of the nanowire, and you can see that the resonant peak is changing to the infrared uh, wavelength region here from the visible region, for example. You can see the electric field distribution in these particular nanowires from the top view. And then based on these designs, and we've really grown the nanowires of different diameters. This is work of my colleague and colleague, Dr. Leon Lee. And uh, so then she will be able to really make contacts with these ones in different parts of the nanowires so that you can be able to detect different parts of this electromagnetic spectrum or the different colors of light essentially. You can see the experimentally measured ones and theoretical ones, they match very well, indicating that now you can make use of these nanowire detectors for multi-wavelength detection. And in this case, I'll just give you an example of how we are making use of these multi-wavelength detectors, either be along with colleagues at the University of Western Australia and taking some flower here and then be able to use our detectors to be able to image these things precisely. And again, this work, uh, again, after two years of hard work of Xeon Lee, and we published its work only late last year or so. And then again, you can now see how we can make use of these narrow wires. And by simply changing the diameter, you can be able to look at this multispectral uh, you know, detection of a wide variety of wavelengths of light, which you're interested in, for example. But this is for security applications and defense applications, and even LIDAR applications where if there is a fog, Visible light is difficult to see, but infrared light you can see through. Now let me move towards nanowire solar cells. Nano, solar cells, all of us have studied about solar cells. And so really you talk about a thin film solar cell, you make a PN junction, and then you make it thick enough to absorb all the sunlight. You make the contacts at the top and the bottom. So that means you can be able to collect the current, for example. When you say the solar cell is about 20% efficient, and 80% of the carriers have been lost to defects or impurities or surfaces. But in the case of nanowires, and then you, you can make the nanowire as long as you want to absorb all the sunlight, and then you make the PN junction in the core shell structure, for example, or you can have the P-type core and N-type shell, and thereby the carriers can be collected very efficiently. And now you're, for the first time, decoupling light absorption pathways and carrier collection pathways, for example. But also these nanowire structures have got low reflection losses. That means you don't need to put any anti-reflection coatings or anything. But also because of the high refractive index of these nanowires, they act like light funnels. That means naturally you're concentrating the light into the nanowire, which really helps in terms of making use of neutrons. Again, we spent a lot of time in doing simulations of what should be the height of the nanowire, what should be the diameter of the nanowire, what should be the diameter to pitch ratio, which is the distance between the nanowires. And typically you only need two to three micron long nanowires of gallium arsenide or indium phosphide, and typically about 150, 160 nanometers, and then diameter to pitch ratio should be 0.5 to 0.6 or so. Again, simulations really play an important role. And this is the work of my uh, former student, Dr. Vidar Raj, who is now at a, uh, in Glasgow University as a postdoctoral fellow. So what he has done is he has grown this P-type indium phosphide nanowires, and then coated this one with the, with the N-type zinc oxide because it's an atomic layer deposition. That means you can get a beautiful transformal coating of these ones and finish off with the aluminum loop zinc oxide to have a better context on them. These are the so-called core cell structures which I was talking to you. And again, by making contacts, by after filling this gap with the polymers and then putting some indium tin oxide contacts on the top and then bottom contact metal, 
and you're able to show the quantum the, the efficiency is about 17% or so in these solar cells, for example, which looks very promising. And more importantly, because we're embedding these uh, uh, nanowires in a polymer, again, we can peel these things off the way we have done for LEDs. They could be very used for flexible solar cell applications where in the future, we should be able to really give you a backpack with solar cells where you'll be able to charge your phones and other things while you're walking on the street, for example. So really, applications really play an important role. And now let me last but one topic of the photoelectrochemistry. chemistry. So as you want to talk about solar cells, and okay, you can only generate uh, electricity during the daytime, but nighttime you need to um, you know, charge the batteries during daytime and make use of batteries or so. But uh, in fact, nowadays people are looking at hydrogen as a clean energy source. So in the case of hydrogen can be a storable energy, transportable energy, and then also that uh, you can use it, you can really get uh, good, uh, of course, use it for a wide variety of applications, generation of electricity and various things. So we've been really looking at the photoelectrochemical water splitting. There are two ways you can do that. Right? You can take uh, two metals like an uh, anode and a cathode, and then connect to a solar cell, which is exposed to sunlight, and then you would really generate the hydrogen by simple electrolysis, for example. The other way to do that one is photoelectrochemistry. We take a photo anode, which is a semiconductor, we excite this one with the light, sunlight, and you create electron hole pairs. Holes go and then oxidize water and generate protons. And electrons go through this circuit and then combine with protons, generate hydrogen here at this metal cathode here. And then here you end up creating oxygen here, for example. Again, this particular work has been led by my, my colleagues, Dr. Shiva Karaturi and Professor Hotan. Okay. The challenge has been either some of these electrodes, anodes, or cathodes are either they're stable but uh, not efficient are otherwise efficient but not stable, trying to find the materials which are both efficient as well as also stable has been a challenge for this particular discipline. So we've taken some gallium nitride nanorods because of the fact that gallium nitride is typically very difficult to etch chemically. And then we try to look at the photoelectrochemistry of this one, photocurrent density as a function of the ore potential, for example, here. But it turned out that even the gallium nitride normally is very difficult to etch. And then photooxidation corrosion takes place and they are not very stable. We have to coat this gallium nitride nanowires with the uh, cobalt oxide. This is the work of my student, former student, Dr. Riddhi, and also young colleague, Dr. Liu. And then we had to coat this with the cobalt oxide to be able to stabilize these ones. And then once we coat this with the cobalt oxide, that acts like a co-catalyst and also whole scavenger. And we're able to really show that they are very good in terms of the stability point of view. But gallium nitride is transparent to the visible light. You're only absorbing the ultraviolet light. Now we're exploring indium phosphide and other semiconductors as well. As I mentioned, that you need to have the efficiency as well as the stability, and also, of course, as well as the cost as well. Because in Australia, the government said that uh, you know they want to have tech that and the government need to asking for scientists to develop the technologies which really allow us to be able to produce one kilo of hydrogen at two dollars a kilo or so. So now let me finish off with the last topic of brain repair. Again, all of us have got uh, 80 billion neurons, and then these neurons form into neuronal network. This is the work of my young colleague, Dr. Vinnie Gautam, who spent some time in my group. Now she's at uh, uh, University of Melbourne as a, a lecturer in biomedical engineering. So we asked our results, whenever you end up having a you know, brain accident or whatever it is, brain essentially damage takes place, essentially you're breaking this neuronal circuit and you lose some other functions, for example. We asked ourselves, can we be able to create a neural patch and be able to make the connections back so that you can be able to give functions back to people, for example. Okay. So in fact, uh, Vinnie Gautam has spent more than two years in optimizing various protocols and then getting the conditions right. And here is a case in neuronal cell. And then as and when these are grown on indium phosphide nanowires, you can see these mini nanowires here can be the close up of this one. These neurites or axons really follow these patterns beautifully here. You can see the dendrites which are coming from these axons. They're also following these topographical features of these nanowires here, for example. Instead of using a single neuronal cell, what will happen if you use multiple neuronal cells? So when you got this in this box is the one where the nanowires are. If you put this, this green blobs of this neuronal cell the body here, soma, I can see that these neurites, neurites and axons are really following these patterns of these square patterns here, for example. If the neurons are grown on the planes, indium phosphide substrate outside, and you can see these neurons are making random connections. So there's no pattern which like this square pattern which you can then create here, for example. So what Vinnie Gautam does is that she does something called calcium imaging. You put the calcium dye, 
As and when these neurons are finding action potentials, ion channels are opened up, calcium ions passes through that one. The fluorescence intensity is dependent on the calcium ion concentration in this particular system which you have got here. Then she tries to make a correlation maps. If this neuron is firing, what's happened to this neuron and this neuron and these astrocytes? And then try to really see whether these neurons are communicating with each other or not. She looked at these nanowires which have grown, uh, neurons which have grown on nanowires, also neurons which have grown on plain glass substrates, typically neuroscientists use, for example. So here is a case where neurons are grown on glass substrates. The change in fluorescence intensity as a function of time. You can see these neurons are randomly firing and you really see very little correlation coefficient. You can see the correlation coefficient is very, very low here. But whereas these neurons have grown on nanowires, and suddenly you can see that all these neurons are firing at the same time. You see excellent correlation coefficient indicating that some sort of a synchronized and correlated activity is taking place in this neural network. And again, Vinay Gautam, when she presented this work at a neuroscience conference in Melbourne four years back, and neuroscientists were excited and they were asking her what neurons she are growing. She said that she's using the rat neurons and they said, how about using human stem cells? So now we got a project funded by the Dementia Australia Research Foundation and the Gilbar Foundation. And then we are working with the stem cell biologists and neurobiologists and the, uh, the computer scientists and nanotechnologists taking the, the stem cells from the Alzheimer's patients and healthy people and then create the mini brains of brain organoids and then really, really studying the signaling differences behavior between the, nano, the neurons, which are the, my, the mini brains from the, the Alzheimer's patients and healthy people using multi-electrode analysis, array analysis or calcium imaging. And we're also developing is also using these deep neural networks and artificial intelligence techniques to be able to really analyze the data which has been produced these ones so that we'll be able to differentiate signaling difference, differences between Alzheimer's patients and healthy people. We're also made developing these nano electrodes so that you'll be able to really measure the single neuronal cell signals and uh, which is again exciting and really interesting as well. So that we can also do the drug screening to be able to identify which drugs are more effective in terms of the Alzheimer's, uh, uh, helping Alzheimer's people. And again, uh, artificial intelligence techniques are also playing a very important role. And again, uh, multiple institutions are involved, about four universities. And again, people with different areas of expertise are working together, which at least I'm learning a lot about neuroscience. And again, working together has been fun. Even understanding each other's language becomes an important thing. With that, and in conclusion, nanowires and nanostructures open up opportunities for manipulation of light matter interaction at the nanoscale and developing new class of lasers and LEDs, infrared and terahertz detectors, integration of optoelectronic devices and various platforms, and developing nanowires solar cells and PEC water splitting, engineering the growth of neuronal networks and so on. With that, let me leave you with some information. It's already been mentioned that I'm currently serving as eight inch of applied physics reviews, uh, which has got a very high impact factor. And we only publish about 10% of the submitted papers. Only think of the breakthrough results when I got, or otherwise you get an authority review or so. And our center of excellence, which has been funded in the beginning of 2021, is a TMOS center from the Australian Research Council. And we once in a while advertise positions in the PhD positions and postdoc positions, and please keep an eye on that one. Also, considering that I also started my life in a small village in India and coming from a farming family and, uh, and lived with a maths teacher and, uh, to be able to finish my high school and also studied in front of a kerosene lamp to be able to finish my primary school or so. And my wife, Vidya, and I have started an endowment really support students and young physicists from the developing countries to come and spend some time at the AANU, particularly during their summer break. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Professor Jagdish for the wonderful and motivational talk. Now the floor is open for discussion. Uh, hello, Professor Jagdish. Uh, thank you for your very thought provoking lecture. And uh, really, we have learned a lot from this um, presentation. And uh, we see some amazing uh, nanostructures which are. Uh, showing uh, very different properties in, from solar cell LED and water splitting. So I have few general questions. Uh, like, uh, what is the minimum prerequisite for the material to be a terahertz detector? So the, the first part I missed. What I know the terahertz detectors. What is the what material? What's the amount of material you're asking, and what? You, you, 
you have been cut off a bit uh, at, the, at the critical point anyway. So really, the, why we are using uh, tera, nanowise for terahertz detection, the reason we are using this one is that uh, you can really make a very, very small detectors instead of having a large detectors in the you know, thin film form or a bulk form. So that means you can be able to put the multiple detectors and uh, so the, you know, in the, in the spot where the terahertz, the typically the typical, you know, means the terahertz spot is about a few millimeters or so. By putting multiple detectors, you'd be able to develop the high resolution terahertz imaging systems for biomedical imaging applications. So that's why we're interested in that particular one, okay? In terms of the diameter of the nanowire, typically we use about 300 micron, uh, 300 nanometer diameter. And uh, I told you that the wavelength of the light is about three, 300 microns, about 1,000 times smaller here. And the length is about typically five, six uh, microns or so. And mainly to be able to manipulate these nanowires easily, to be able to locate them in this uh, you know, bauta antenna, which I've shown you earlier, okay? So that's why the limiting factor in order not to be able to make these. Uh, we can, we've, we've made some nanowire detectors which are as small as uh, uh, the uh, three micro three micron long nanowires, but it becomes a fabrication becomes much more challenging. But the key thing is the light need to be coupled because you're talking about you know few micron long nanostructures and then wavelength of 300 microns. That's where the nano antennas really play an important role. That's where we have to use these bulk antennas in order to do larger wavelength light into the small nanostructures. And also we've shown uh, that you get excellent signal to noise ratio. I hope you I answered your question. Uh, you have answered the question <laughs> nicely, okay. and uh, I just have one doubt: is the what is the conductivity range is required for this material to be? Means uh, how much uh, centimeter square per uh, centimeter square pull per second is uh, okay. prerequisite? Okay, that's a good question. So really, it's interesting. Ideally, what you want to have is, and the, means uh, you really want to have uh, materials which have got the low conductivity, so that means you got a low dark current, for example. Right, the signal to noise ratio is dependent on the lower the dark current, then you'll be able to detect a small number of photons very efficiently. But the problem is you've got a low conductivity material, making good contacts becomes a challenge. So that means this becomes a compromise. So what we found is, instead of using a simple nanowise of a particular conductivity, what we have grown, in fact, have shown is, you grow the you know, N-type uh, indium phosphide, and then do the undoped indium phosphide and then finish off with the enthope indium phosphide. So there where the contacts are made on this enthype part and then the undoped part is the one where the, you know, the, the light, has been absorbed, light has been really generated. So thereby excited with the laser pulse. So thereby you're able to get excellent signal to noise ratio also. So essentially how, how good contacts you can make for a semiconductor it becomes an important issue. Depends on which semiconductor you're looking at. But if you don't have the possibility of able to do something I would advise you to be able to create either NIN and PIT structures. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, also uh, regarding the synthesis, so you have almost for all, for all of your nanostructures, you have used um, gold nanoparticle as the seeding agent to grow this nano uh, wares. And after the synthesis, how do you remove such gold nanoparticle? Because some of, some of your structure, I can still see that gold nan nanoparticle is sitting on the top. Will that facilitate your uh, application or will that uh, create some problem? Oh, that's a good question. By the way, then we're, we're only using the gold nanoparticles as and when we're using this so-called VLS growth process, vapor liquid solid growth mechanism. And on the selective epitaxy, we don't use any gold nanoparticles, just to, just to clarify that one. And coming to your question, so it turns out, in fact, sometimes, you know, means you can really have uh, these, these gold nanoparticles can be useful, for example, if you're using for terse applications, you know, the, Keep enhances uh, Raman scattering for detection of molecules and other things people always wanted to have. At the tip of this, uh, uh, the tip they wanted to have a metal nanoparticle and it turns yes. out gold is very good yes. from that point of view. Yes. But also if you're making the, the contacts, for example, then it, it's okay. But whenever we don't want to have nano, uh, the, uh, the don't want to have any gold, what we end up doing is we can selectively etch that one up. Then what happens is that uh, you know, the KOH type uh, solution, for example. But then what happens in that process, the, you know, these nanowires, you know, because of this liquid being there, they start, uh, you know, coming together and then bunch, to, bunch together. That, that you want to avoid, particularly if there are smaller diameter nanowires. So what we typically end up doing is that we, if we want to really get rid of this um, um, uh, gold, we fill this one with the polymer first and then expose the tips and then get rid of the gold. So then it becomes easier from that point of view. And lots of times when you're making electrical contacts and other things, 
the gold is in fact is useful, but it doesn't really cause us any problems or anything. And depending on what applications you're using, you'll do the right thing. In terms of removing the nanowires themselves, there are two ways we do that one. One way to do that one is that you put this uh, uh, sa sample with the nanowires into ultrasonic bath and with some alcohol, for example, isopropanol or something, and then you use this ultrasonic bath and these nanowires break off at the bottom mostly. Then you know you take the liquid with, uh, with containing nanowires with the pipette and then put a droplet of that one and then look for these nanowires under a microscope and then make contacts in the, uh, for those ones particularly, for example. Okay, but that's why electron lithography plays an important role. And other way to do that one is to take the nanowires substrate and then put, put it other way around, rub onto the other substrate where you want to transfer these ones. And because of the fact that these are you know, fragile nanostructures, they can rub off and then be able to really transfer their, them there as well. Sometimes what we do is that we fill these things with the, uh, the uh, polymer and you peel these things off with the polymer, so that means they get embedded in the polymer as well. Depending again on applications, we end up choosing the right kind of a technique and uh, that's what we end up doing. Thank you. Thank you for the explaining this one. All uh, our explanations. Thank you. Yeah, Hello, I want to intro introduce myself. So my name is Samrat Ghosh. Uh, I work in uh, as a scientist. Um, and my final question is uh, regarding a very general thing because I work on the organic semiconductor. So uh, you work on the inorganic semiconductors and all the processes you have mentioned. How do you see the prospect of organic semiconductor in the applications like, like you have shown uh, today? Uh, how do you see their future as flexible electronics? Okay, the, of course, organic electronic, organic semiconductors have an important role to play. By the way, in fact, Dr. Vinnie Gautam, she has really was working on organic neurosensors while she was doing her PhD at Jawaharlal Nehru uh, Center for Advanced Scientific Research in Bangalore. And then she came and joined me. I said, look, I'm not an expert in organic semiconductors and go and talk to people. Those are experts in this area. None of them had any positions. And that's where we said, okay, let's go and see how can you make use of these nanowires for neuroscience applications also? But also that what we're doing is also when you're making these nanowire solar cells, which I was mentioning to you, the gap, the gap has been filled with polymer I was mentioning and working with Professor Laura Hertz, who is an expert in organic semiconductor at Oxford University, where she did her PhD with Richard Trenner at Cambridge University. And then we end up filling these ones, organic semiconductors and the PPV, uh, GHV and P, PPV and various materials. And then we use these things also combination of organic and inorganic semiconductors. Of course, organic semiconductors have an important role to play organic solar cells. The efficiency has been stuck around, you know, means uh, uh, 10 or 11 percent. But uh, my good friend, Steve, Professor Steve Forrest from University of Michigan told me that he's already got 16 percent. And in fact, uh, the, his solar cells are more stable than perovskite solar cells, for example. We're already using organic semiconductors for flexible electronics and also for flexible displays, for example, and uh, so LEDs and other things. So really organic semiconductors have an important role to play. Again, depending on what purpose you're using what, and you end up choosing those ones. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Professor, I have another question. Uh, very excellent uh, lecture. Um, I was uh, very excited uh, to see your work on uh, the distinguishing between the cell lines of those with dementia and uh, and dementia. So very often what I wonder is, you know, in such kind of studies, there are also other things, you know, uh, one thing is signaling is one most important thing. There are also other enzymes or other organic molecules that play. How do we put all of them together? Because uh, this is something, uh, you know, which can get us some breakthrough. So th this, I think in other studies also, uh, I think has not been taken into consideration. I think you raise an important point, and that's where you know, identifying signals are where they are coming from becomes an important issue. And uh, so, the, basically, in fact, that's one of the reasons, for example, there's a lot of discussion is taking place, you know, what is the role of glia cells, for example, and uh, in the brain, for example. And, you know, of course, earlier people used to think that glia cells don't have an important role to play, but now they are saying that uh, they have a very important role to play. So, that's why what we're doing is that using this CRISPR technology, taking stem cells and using CRISPR technology. And then we're introducing, say, for example, astrocytes in a selective way and glia cells in a selective way, and then see how the signaling behaviors, behavior is changing or so. So really the combination of stem cell technology, CRISPR technology, and of course, these uh, you know, nanotechnology and others, and including artificial intelligence techniques are really playing an important role. And then to ensure that we are not really blindly thinking that something else is happening, we are really interpreting that that's what is happening. So, And most interestingly, you mentioned about signaling issues. In fact, I spent in 2018, five months in uh, University of California, San Diego, in Professor Shadi Dayas group, 
He has also been developing these nano wires for is, uh, signaling the measure, signal measurement purposes. In fact, these nano wires uh, st structures have been used on real patients in the Mass General Hospital in Boston, and we able to particularly do the neurosurgery and uh, identifying where the particularly, for example, epilepsy patients and other things, which part of the brain is not working and using these measurements and be able to only do the precise surgery of these ones. The opportunities are enormous. And of course, most interestingly, uh, 30 years back, uh, people used to say that we only know 5% of the, how the brain works, 94% of the parts we don't know. Even after 30 years, of 30 years of research and advanced techniques, people say the same thing. We only know how the brain works for 5%, till 95% we need to learn. So that's why, Working with colleagues and then multidisciplinary approaches are absolutely critical to be able to better understand what is contributing to what. It's a very good question. Can Thank I ask you, Professor? Question. Absolutely. Thank you. Can I ask my question? So one short question. Sure. Please go ahead, Rohan. Uh, sure. Sir, uh, this regarding this, uh, you showed like diameter of nano wires. You could show like different absorption spectra. But in terms of uh, with usage, if the diameters they change with, uh, you know. Uh, how much is the shelf life like? Because if the diameters change with the use, then uh, the absorption spectra might overlap kind of. Yeah, sure, that's a good question. But the thing is that you see, that's the beauty of these three five semiconductors. You know, generally there's no problem. For example, just to give an idea that uh, the lasers which are made out of three five semiconductors, in fact, we used to do a lot of high power lasers for communications applications or so uh, in the uh, early nineties. And in fact, I started a company to commercialize the technology and other things. That's a different story. And, uh, you know, some of these lasers last for about 25 years in the, particularly they're used, uh, in the, you know, these, uh, submarine, uh, communication systems be between the continents. And then the requirement is that these lasers need to last for 25 years or so. That means packaging and other things really becomes an important issue as well. And also that, uh, because see, that's where the inorganic semiconductors have some advantage over the organic semiconductors. But again, you know, how do you passivate the surfaces and how we embed these things into packaging and other things also play an important role. Thank you, sir. Ramit. Yeah, may, I ask, uh, may I ask a question, sir? Uh, please go ahead, Ramit. Uh, yeah, sir. Uh, actually, I want to know, like, uh, most of your work is on, like, a uh, bottom-up approach, right? So, uh, like, uh, what will be the problem if, 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 one, if anyone uh, consider uh, bottom the top down approach instead of bottom up approach similar okay, kind of good, okay good question so the funny enough uh, that uh, the neuroscience work which i've shown you they're all the nanowires which are made out of the top bottom top down approach reason being we wanted to have large areas it's much easier to do the top down approach and that's what we are doing and uh, also the selective area epitaxy in fact make use of the top down and bottom up in other words Electron beam lithography, you can consider that as a top down, uh, the, you know, top down patterning, and then the growth is a bottom up. So ultimately, depending on what applications you have, and uh, so the uh, you can make use of both the top down and the bottom up approaches. So in the in the early nineties, I mean mid nineties and two thousands, people used to talk about self assembly and all these things, but it turned out that when you look at the self assembly process. Only in the smaller regions, you see the self-assembled structures and we can take a nice SEM picture and write a nice paper. But if you look at the large areas, you know, then there's a lot of defects and all these things. So that's why if you want to call it as nowadays, people talk about a guided self-assembly, like the one which I've shown you about self aware taxi, for example. By using that combination of those ones, you'll be able to get the best out of both worlds. Did I answer your question, Ramit? Uh, no, no, thank you. Uh, before we the next question, can I request everyone of you to please uh, switch on your cameras for a couple of minutes uh, so that uh, Amit can take some photographs uh, for this event. Amit, Guru Prasad, Kumzavar is there. Please uh, ensure that, you know, uh, request everyone of you to please uh, switch on your cameras for a couple of minutes while we can continue on the questions also, please. Yeah. Any questions? Any more yeah, questions? Feel free to ask any questions you may have. There is one question in the question box. Abhinash Dash okay. asks, gold nanoparticle modified photoanode could be the promising alternative to replace the existing photoanode material for improved photoelectrochemical water splitting. Can you please share your opinion on that? Yeah, I think that's a good point, uh, Abhinash. And, uh, so basically, gold can act like, a, for example, like a a plasma and resonance structure, for example. That means it will be able to really couple right much more efficiently. 
what are the things which we have been really looking at in the case of solar cells and other things and other opto electronic devices of how to couple the light efficiently, how to extract the light efficiently, and all those physics uh, which you're able to apply in the photoelectrochemistry as well. And that's what we're really trying to exploit uh, there. And certainly the gold, gold nanoparticles could potentially be used. There's no major problem from that point of view. But again, their distribution and other things really plays an important role. And again, how do you transfer the charges from these gold nanoparticles onto your photoanodes and then be able to connect to the external circuit really becomes an important issue as well. In principle, yes, it's, it's a possibility. Though we haven't really explored that that, one, that much because we are more focusing on how to enhance the efficiency and also how to stabilize these structures, you know, because uh, the challenge, as I mentioned to you, either materials are really stable, but they're not very efficient, but are always very efficient, but they're not stable. And industry, when I talk to them, they always ask for, you know, we want to really have uh, very stable and very efficient uh, uh, and a low cost uh, uh, electrodes, both photoanodes and photocathodes. Again, we are really trying to replace also platinum, which is an expensive cathode with the nickel and other materials as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, so if you have no other questions, uh what we may do is to go ahead and uh, thank the speaker for this wonderful uh, lecture. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jagdish, for this uh, great opportunity to listen to you. And I'm very sure most of my students uh, in the campus and in other campuses of uh, various organizations would have tremendously benefited uh, from this uh, talk. And uh, I would certainly say that it's been a very memorable uh, lecture for all of us uh, as a part of the centenary celebrations. Uh, I would now leave to Amit to kind of uh, close the proceedings, please. Thank you, Professor Shiram. It's a pleasure, honor and a pleasure for me, particularly honoring Professor Naidama, as okay. I mentioned that he was my childhood hero. And he continues to be my hero even today. Thank you, Professor. On behalf of uh, CSIR CLRI, I thank Professor Jagdish for accepting our invitation to deliver the Azadika Amrit Mahotsav and Nayudamma Centenary Lecture. Sir, thank you for the motivational talk and enlightening us about the semiconductor nano architecture for optoelectronic applications like laser that can operate at room temperature, nanowire arrays for security applications, and photoelectrochemical water splitting and brain repair, especially using neural network and organoids. I thank the director, CSIR CLRI, colleagues, and one and all present here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Th thank, thank you all you. and good luck to all of you with CLRI. And then I have always had we, very high regard for CS, uh, CLRI. Good luck to all of you. Thank we you look forward much. to being in touch with you, sir. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.